Well, hello, everybody. This is Lisa Nearing from True North Homeschool Academy, and I am so glad that you are here to join us for How to Homeschool Elementary. It is really not that hard, and I'm delighted to talk to you guys about elementary school this morning. Um, I like to introduce myself by saying I have one husband, two graduate degrees, five kids, and a black belt in homeschooling. So uh, we homeschooled for 30 years. Our kids are now between the ages of 21 and 38. We have a couple of homeschool um, grandkids. I also have two master's degrees, one in human development, one in marriage and family therapy. Um, and uh, I love education. I love homeschooling. I think it's a beautiful way to raise your family. And elementary school is a great place to start. So let's dive into how to homeschool elementary school. First of all, one thing I want you guys to realize is that for elementary school students, the world is new. Almost everything that they encounter is like a Shazam moment, like they haven't seen the bugs before. There's a lot of experiences that they might not have done yet. And so you've got to just realize that they're experiencing so much and there's a learning curve involved to so much of what they are learning. So learning curves include failure. <laughs> Hopefully we can teach our kids resiliency and how to fail forward. But if they have one bad experience, we don't want that to color all their experiences. But just keeping in mind that so much of what they do experience is new to them. Now, my kids are 16 years apart in age from youngest to oldest. So there's a three and a half to five year gap between each one of my kids. You know, it's kind of one of those things where I planned and then God said, here's your life. <laughs> Probably the same for you, right? And so by the time my youngest daughter was ready to do things for the first time, our family had done them dozens, maybe even hundreds of times. Um, books that she experienced, uh, for instance, Are You My Mother?, my second daughter, um, <laughs> who was 12 years older than her, she loved that book so much. We read it every night for probably three years. So I had literally read that book dozens and dozens of time, times. But for her, it was a new experience. And so keep that in mind for your kids. That might help just help you understand them better and keep your frustration levels lower as they're taking a hard, uh, uh, taking a little bit of time to understand the world and learn things. The world is new. What they're experiencing, they haven't experienced before, no matter how many times you have. The second thing, you have, you have a really distinct role, and I apologize for the misspelling on here. Parents have a very distinct role in the life of their kids when their kids are little, so I want to talk about that really quickly. Your job is to introduce your kids to the world. That's your job as parents. You keep them safe from diving off a cliff or from seeing um, nefarious activity or experiencing problematic kind of things. That's your job. You're introducing the, your kids to the world and you're keeping them safe physically, mentally, and spiritually at the same time. So you're making those determinations. What is it that you want to introduce your kids to? What things do you not want to? And that's perfectly within your rights as a parent. That is actually your role as a parent. Secondly, it's your job to ensure a strong academic start um, and to find out what is going to be a strong academic start for my kids. That might be public, private, or homeschool. There's so many alternative educational opportunities right now with micro schools and charter dollars, ESA, et cetera. So it might be a combination of the above, but it is really your job and your task to sort out how you're going to educate your kids and how you're going to do it well. And then another thing that you really have to do is your role and your role as a parent is to balance task versus relationship. Now, when we have little kids, we have a lot of tasks. We've got to get them changed, fed, groomed, uh, educated, teach them how to interact with dogs and grandparents and all the things. But then there's this relationship responsibility where we want them to see, feel safe and emotionally connected. And some of us are more task oriented. Some of us are more relationship oriented. And so it's our job and responsibility to determine which one are we more predominant in and what about our kids? Now you can make this balance easier to manage by removing low level decisions from your life. So instead of getting up in the morning and have your kids pick from 60 outfits, have four outfits or have two pairs of pants that look the same um, and do the same for yourself. You eat the same breakfast day after day. It just takes so much off your plate to have like really literally set routines and decisions already made for you. And that allows you to balance that task versus relationship longer during the day. Oops, I skipped ahead one too many here.
I think there's really an important um, distinction between fun and fulfillment as you're educating your elementary kids. Both are super important. Fun is very important. A lot of times our kids learn better when we're having fun at the same time that they're learning, but you can have learning take place without fun. Something, a fun is something that a person enjoys just for the sake of doing it. Like some people really enjoy biking. Some people enjoy eating, whatever it is. Um, it usually doesn't cost as much. Oftentimes it's passive, but it doesn't always take skill or effort from us. That is different than fulfillment. Hard work and effort lead to a reward, something like phonics, that it actually takes some effort to learn. But once the kids have learned phonics, they're well on the path to literacy. And that is a very fulfilling um, accomplishment, both for whoever is becoming literate and the person who's teaching that skill set. So it might not be fun, but it can be very, very fulfilling and it can have long-term benefits. So just keep in mind that fun and fulfillment are a little bit different. Both are super important. And how are you going to balance those? I like to just share a possible schedule because I think this can be helpful, especially if you're managing a lot of little kids or you're working while you're homeschooling. One of the things that we always did as we homeschooled is we did skills-based learning in the morning and content-based learning in the afternoon. What is the difference between those? Skills-based is that it's logical, sequential. You can't get to C until you have A and B under your belt. Content-based is there's no sequential learning. You can learn D before you learn B. It doesn't really matter. So for instance, in the morning, we would do breakfast and morning chores. We did a morning gathering or a morning basket for years and years where we would meet at nine. We do memory work, Bible, foreign language maps, et cetera, all together, regardless of the age spread. Whoever was at home, we would do this for one hour. We would have done it all day long if we hadn't set that time limit on it because we loved that time so much. And then we would do skills-based learning, things like math, phonics, Latin, grammar, things that you have to learn A, B, C, D before you can get to EFG, et cetera. Then we'd have a break for outside play, art, music, a snack, because you know, you got to eat. And then we would do some more skills-based learning in the morning. We'd have lunch. We would usually all eat lunch together. We would eat something very simple. And then afternoon, we would do, if naps were still needed, we would do naps, lunch and chores, songs and poetry. Um, and then, you know, whoever needed to rest, quiet time, et cetera. And then we would do content-based learning together, unit studies, history, literature. Again, learning that is not skills-based. You don't have to have um, certain skills mastered before you can go on to others. And then we would have plenty of time for outside play, arts and crafts, delight directed um, studies or whatever the kids wanted to do. In the evening, we would often cook and clean together and go on a, on a walk or do games or even more reading, honestly. So it's a really simple schedule that you can follow if that's helpful to you. I know some people really like to get down to the nitty gritty and say, for this 20 minutes, I'm doing this and, and et cetera. Those kind of schedules do not work for me and my personality. I don't like to be really constrained by time because there's always things that come up. And when you have a large family um, and animals, which we did for years, you know that that's true. Secondly, I did work for a third of the time that we homeschooled. And so if there was an emergency meeting or a, a really a phone call that I had to take, I didn't want everything to be thrown off because we were we missed our 20 minutes or whatever. And if you have like more um, activity-based, then you can just do more flowing. I also really like open and go curriculum because then you can loop it. You know what I mean? Like if you don't get that lesson done today or you haven't completed it today, it's okay to close the book and come back tomorrow and just pick it up. Now, many times we just did year round schooling, not all, the, not all the time. Sometimes we would take a really clear summer break. It just depended on what we did that summer and what kind of traveling we were doing and those kind of things. So again, make homeschooling work for you. I really think there's five solid pillars of elementary school and that has to do with reading and writing, arithmetic, memory work, faith formation, work and play. And we're gonna talk about each one of these pillars in the rest of the presentation. So let's talk about language literacy, K through sixth grade. I think it's made up of four things. Now you're gonna probably hear it's reading and writing, but I think it also has to do with speaking and listening. And the earlier we can get our kids speaking out loud, even doing simple things like show and tell in front of a group or whatever, the less likelihood that they're gonna be afraid of doing that as they get older. It's still the number one fear of people in America, even more so than deaf. What does it mean to read and write well? What does language literacy really look like? Um, right now, there is a, a serious problem in America where people really aren't um, past functional literacy. Functional literacy means that they can read and write at a fifth grade level. 
but they can't really read complex ideas and thoughts for understanding. They can't narrate it back. They can't write about it. And so what I mean by language literacy is that they're completely fluent in reading to themselves and to others with understanding. They can narrate back to you what it means. They can write. Um, by the end of sixth grade, they should be able to write a complete sentence. In English, that means subject verb. They should be able to write a, actually a pretty good paragraph. Um, with a topic sentence and you know that it makes sense and holds together. Now, they might not be able to identify topic sentence necessarily, but they should be able to have a paragraph of thoughts that are connected and make sense. Um, they should be able to speak well and articulately. Um, they should be able to introduce themselves. They should be able to say hi when they're spoken to. And they should actually be able to stand up in a small group of people and talk about their favorite pet or stuffed animal or whatever. They should also, I've alluded to this already, be able to listen and narrate back what they've heard with understanding. Um, and so these are really all four components of language literacy. What are some common challenges to language literacy? You've heard of a few of them. Um, dyslexia, which is difficulty reading. Dysgraphia, which is difficulty writing. And this often goes with ADD or ADHD. Speech disorders like tongue tie possibly or others. Auditory processing disorder, language processing disorder, and other learning disabilities like low IQ or autism, et cetera. Now, uh, learning disabilities have to do with how you take in information or how you give back information. So some of these are input, some of these are output. And how you approach these and how you help your kids overcome these are all gonna be different depending on what they are. And if it's a cluster or if it's just a standalone LD, so you're gonna want to um, be aware of these. If your kids are really struggling, you might wanna contact a specialist and just get some just get some tips and tricks. Some kids just mature at a different rate and they mature academically at a different rate too. That's fine. That's the human condition. We're not average people. Everybody has their own gifts and strengths and challenges. Um, disorders, if you don't catch it and your kids can manage it, um, they're probably going to do, uh, they're probably going to just get by. However, at some point they might really struggle. So if you're fighting all the time and your kids are fighting all the time about a certain language, about a certain activity or whatever, you might want to just see if there's other resources available to test and see where your kid is at. Um, reading and writing, um, some great, uh, great ways to help your kids with language literacy, get a solid phonics program. We used Alpha Phonics for all five of my kids. I love Alpha Phonics. I think it's a really solid program and I highly recommend it. But get one. You don't have to have a lot of bells and whistles to be an effective program. Do a lot of read out louds with your kids. Talk to your kids. Uh, read aloud to them. Have them listen to books on tape. I love poetry. Poetry helps your kids understand tropes and the beauty of language and also the rhythm of language. Help your kids understand the foundations of grammar. Again, in English, it's subject verb to make a complete sentence. If you mess that up, you're not going to have a good sentence. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, help your kids understand narration and writing and cursive. And I think this is a very important neurological task for your kids to learn uh, because it, again, writing by hand and cursive actually creates different neural pathways in your brain than typing on the computer. So I think it's a great opportunity for your kids to build some plasticity in their brain. Let's talk about arithmetic. So math literacy in elementary school um, includes addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And by the end of sixth grade, your kids should have fluency in this. And what does that mean? They should have it memorized without skip counting, without counting on their fingers, without um, doing the song. They should just be able to go, okay, seven times six is 42. Um, because as they get into more complex math, having those, having those basic functions memorized is going to help them do math more quickly and they're gonna get through more advanced math without getting stuck on the simple math. They should also, as they get into middle school, start learning, well, fifth grade, really, they're gonna start doing long division. So they should have a really good solid understanding of division, fractions, decimals, and percents. Your kids should really understand how to tell time. And that is on an analog clock as well. Um, the basics of money, story problems, which can be a little confusing for kids because it's language talking about symbols, uh, so some kids really might struggle with that, but it's a worthy pursuit to really understand story problems. They're going to have more of them as they get into eighth and ninth grade. They should really have memorized rules, formulas, and terms as well as syncrasy. Because if they don't, when they get to algebra, they're going to say, 
Okay, PEMDAS, what does that mean? I'm going to just like subtract before I multiply and they're going to get the answer wrong, not because they're bad at algebra, but because they haven't memorized some basics of math and arithmetic. So what are some common challenges to numeric literacy? Dyscalculia, which is difficulty with mathematics, and dyslexia. As many as 60% of dyslexic students may also be dyscalculic, which I don't think a lot of people realize, but they often go hand in hand and possibly some other LDs too. How do you really teach solid arithmetic skills, sequencing, um, math functions, critical thinking, deductive reasoning? Um, I think having a really good solid math program, we loved Right Start Math. Um, I think it's such a great one. It, it really comes with math manipulatives and it really simplifies complex ideas. And they have math games program, which is super fun. I think um, deductive reasoning games, um, perplexers by Mindware, we love those. I think it's a great skill to have your kids start when they're young. And board games, of course, are a great way to teach um, arithmetic and critical thinking skills. Memory work. I think a lot of people over, overlook the importance of memory work as your kids are younger. I'm in elementary school, but I think it's super, super important. This is an ancient saying, repetitio mater studiorium est, and it just simply means memory is the mother of learning. And I think we overlook the fact that so much great learning is done by memory, memory work. It's one of the foundational study skills. And if our kids have some things memorized, their brain can go on to synthesize and synergize a lot of diverse information and create new and exciting ideas. So for math, math facts and formulas should be memorized, English, grammar, poems, and even speeches. Science, absolutely the scientific method, animal and plant classification. And listen, most kids love memory work if it's done right. History and Bible, they should understand the people, places, events, geography, and culture. Foreign language, vocabulary, grammar, phrases, accent, and culture. Most younger kids don't realize that a foreign language uh, can be difficult. And so if you teach them younger, they just think it's a game. Some common challenges to memory work, not understanding how to memorize in a way that's engaging and fun. And that that was always uh, my pro problem growing up. I didn't realize that I knew I needed to memorize things, but it was always challenging to me. And when I got up, grew up and started homeschooling my own kids, I'm like, wow, this, there's some fun ways to make this happen. So, so go after it, figure out what are some fun ways to help my kids memorize and myself as well. Uh, memory issues are common in kids with learning disabilities, both working and long-term memory. If I have a parent call me and say, my kid just doesn't seem to remember very well. I'm like, are they, have they been tested for learning disabilities? So it might be a clue that your kid has learning disabilities. Not 100% of the time, but just something to be aware of. And another challenge that's um, to memory work is that the context is confusing or it lacks, the memory work lacks context completely. And that makes things more difficult to memorize. Um, some ways to incorporate memory work or to, to, yeah, to incorporate memory work in your home school. Repetition is tied into neural pathways. So include some movement. Do reading, do listening, do a combination of both, play games. Um, repetition and memory work are, can be super fun. Okay, don't overlook work and play. This is so important to your elementary school kiddo. Um, we loved open-ended play toys like Brio Train, um, Briar Horses, Playmobil, Legos, things that help build your kids' creativity and imagination. Don't forget green therapy. What does that mean? Get outside. That's it. That's all it means. So green therapy is so very important to your kids to have them go outside every single day. We live in the far north. It didn't matter. I'd be like, put your coats on, go out. Arts and crafts, most kids, this helps your kids develop fine motor skills and coordination. So super important. Um, dress up and imaginary play is super fun for most kids. And then don't neglect to teach your kids basic hygiene, how to brush their hair and their teeth on the daily, et cetera. Help them um, include them in cleaning the household chores. And then basic kitchen and cooking skills. Most kids love being in the kitchen. If you're in the kitchen, we did a lot of this together over the years, like just for years, we cook and clean together. My daughter and I still do occasionally. How to handle money and basic first aid. What are some challenges to work and play? Well, there's too many electronics in your home. Um, or there's too much amusement, amusement, and that can be a combination of electronics and other things. But I would say if you really want your kids to learn to work and play, you need to really limit the electronics. The younger they are, the less they get access to it. They don't need it. 
it changes the neural um, pathways in their brain and they're not developing neural pathways that are going to help them build resilience and other things that they'll need in life to be a functioning adult. Um, also, you're not willing to let the kids get bored. Um, the deal is uh, if kids get bored, then they can figure out how to make their fun and, or they can go figure out how to read a book or whatever. But if you're always constantly entertaining and amusing your kids, they don't have that opportunity to figure things out for themselves. The, the kind of the opposite of that is that there's too much structured playtime. So make sure that they have some downtime that they have to figure out themselves without electronics or prepackaged amusement. Another challenge is that it's just easier to do it yourself. And I, I agree, it oftentimes is easier to do it ourselves in the short term. In the long term, however, if we want functioning adults at the end of the day, we need to give our kids opportunities to do it, mess up and fail forward. Another issue that I think is really a problem is that a lot of parents don't have a clear vision. Why are they educating their kids and what is the end? And your kids are in elementary school, so that might seem like, wow, that's like way out there. Like it doesn't even matter at this point. But really, who do you want your kid to be when they're 18, 20, 24 as a young adult functioning in society? Do you want them to have the skills and abilities that they need to function well on their own? If so, lay that foundation now. And then you don't really understand what kids are capable of. This is common. I mean, I have a master's degree in human development. I love this kind of stuff. So really understanding ages and stages, super helpful and important as you're raising your kids. Let's talk about faith formation for a minute. Um, when your kids are in elementary school, you as the parent are laying the foundations of faith for your kids. The Bible is God communicating with us and prayer is us communicating to God. Both of these are super important for our kids to understand. Both kids have a sense of um, morality and faith, generally, I would say, and we do kind of live in a Christian milieu still in America, some set, some ways. Um, and so they've heard about it and they have questions they want answers to. And as the parent, you are the vision caster. So what do you want to teach? What people, places, main events, and main themes are important for you to communicate to your kid? They're gonna be very open to them in elementary school. So now's a great time to share the foundations of your faith. Read the Bible out loud together. Um, go to church together. What are some common challenges to faith formation? In my experience, parents feel inadequate to lead their kids. They're not really sure about it themselves, and they're not sure about their own beliefs or what the Bible actually means. Parents also want their kids to work it out for themselves, or they've outsourced it to church or to other other entities like Sunday school. And so I think um, as parents, again, it's really our job to set the vision for our kids. So what do we want our kids to learn and know about? Do we want them to know our testimony and our faith journey? Um, is that gonna be helpful to them? And we love reading biographies of all kinds at in our home. And so I think reading biographies of great men and women of the faith can be super helpful to your kids. Um, we have this great free workshop for you. Here's a QR code. It's for a free workshop called What Does a Homeschooler Actually Do? And I just break down the roles of the homeschool parent. I, I love it. I think it's super helpful for you. We also have classes at elementary, uh, elementary classes at True North Homeschool Academy. We have writing classes, um, science exploration, expedition classes, Spanish, French, history, and Bible. We don't offer math until seventh grade. But everything else we do offer at Turnarth, you can take a full load at Turnarth Homeschool Academy. Um, we love coming alongside homeschool parents who are intentionally educating their kids. It's so much fun. Most of us have homeschooled or are still homeschooling. And so we totally get the unique aspects of the homeschool lifestyle. Um, we also have testing at Turnarth Homeschool Academy is diagnostic testing. It's a tool, not a label. It can provide a clear assessment of where your kids are at academically so that you can plan from there. Where are they at? Are they ahead? Are they behind? Are they on track? And where do you want to get to? Any areas that your kids aren't strong in, I would say this in, in elementary school, pause and get your kids up to speed. The main point of elementary school is numeric literacy and also um, language literacy. So if they can get those two things down in elementary school, everything else is a bonus, but there's so much more to do in home in elementary school. Don't forget the field trips and the arts and crafts and the reading out loud. It's such a fun time to educate your kids. Um, again, at Trinidad Home School Academy, we have 30 plus live online elementary and junior high classes, testing, advising, and we'd love to come alongside you as you're homeschooling. Let us know if you have any questions and we'd love to chat with you. You can find us at truenorthhomeschool.academy. 
Thanks for listening in, everybody. I hope this has been helpful to you, and I will talk to you later.